Well, happy Father's Day to each of the fathers out there. Uh, it's a, isn't it a privilege to be a dad? Yeah. Amen? Amen. I got, I got a, a really uh, good couple of days in here. My, my daughter came to visit, and our son came to visit as well from Quinnell, and got to spend time with the two of them, plus our, our little grandson. So, yeah, it was a good, uh, a good lead up to Father's Day. Was, I, I know you guys are all looking forward to spending the afternoon with your families or doing something special. Well, today we're going to be talking about fathers, but we're going to be talking about our Heavenly Father. Um, it just so happens that today's message falls upon the theme of father and son. And uh, would you bow with me in prayer before we open the word here? Um, Jesus, we just want to thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your revelation. We thank you for being who you are. We thank you, Jesus, that you and our Heavenly Father are one. And God, we just pray that as we open the book of John, God, that you would, uh, you would stir our hearts to, to, uh, to remember who you are and the power of your resurrection, Lord, and, and who you are in, in, in relation to, uh, to the Trinity. And we praise you and we thank you, Jesus, for this day. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to continue our journey through the book of John this morning, and we come to John chapter 5, verse 19. Now, in the first part of chapter 5, uh, leading up uh, to verse 18, we saw that uh, Jesus uh, visited the, the pool at Bethesda, and he healed a crippled man uh, there on the Sabbath day. And upon healing him, uh, Jesus told this man to pick up his bedroll and, and go. And um, this act was actually in opposition to the religious tradition of the day, um, was, which, which had an interpretation that carrying any kind of a load on the Sabbath day was a big no-no. And uh, the law, they, they interpreted the law of Moses to, uh, to, to say that uh, you couldn't do anything uh, like that uh, and if you did, you were, you were, you were just uh, you were breaking the Sabbath law. So Jesus went on to express that their interpretation of the Sabbath law was faulty. And he uh, claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. And uh, th like his father, he said that God's work continues uh, all the time. And uh, when, he, when he's talking about that, uh, God never stops uh, being merciful or, or having grace. And so his work continues. And, and when the religious leaders heard what he had to say, um, they, uh, they were very upset. As a matter of fact, they, uh, they uh, were so angry at Jesus that they wanted to kill him. So um, Jesus had something to say to them after he had uh, this issue with them. And this is where we pick up on our text this morning, which is found in John chapter 5, verses 19 to 47. So if you've got your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me this morning to Matthew, or, uh, John chapter 5, uh, starting with verse 19, we'll, we'll put it up on the overhead here as well. Um, so this is the setting. They were going to kill him. They wanted to kill him. They couldn't stand the fact that he was uh, doing things differently than they thought was right, and that he claimed that God was his father. So Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son, does, uh, son also does. So as I mentioned already, Jesus had told the Jews, uh, the religious leaders of the Jews, that God was his father. And here in, in verse 19, he unashamedly, he repeats it. And uh, they understood this, that when, when Jesus was claiming God as his father, they understood that he was actually claiming equality with God. Now, in their minds, this was blasphemy because they didn't accept him as the Messiah. What did they think? Why did they think this? Now, Jesus... Um, Jesus was different than the stereotype Messiah that they thought was going to be visiting them. So he, he, he didn't act like who they thought the Messiah should act like. And, and they, were, they were undoubtedly familiar 
with the prophecies of Daniel, you know, these guys were not uh, unaware of the Old Testament, of the law, and of the prophets. They weren't unaware of this. And, and they would have been aware of the prophecies of Daniel, where Daniel predicted that the Messiah would come into the world as a son of man, yet he would be worshipped because he was God in the flesh. Now Jesus was claiming, in a sense, by saying that he was the son of the Father, he was claiming that he was God in the flesh. And that's why they said they, they were offended because he was claiming equality with God. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, there was a prophetic prediction, and this is many, many years before Jesus was on the earth, for those of you who don't know your Old Testament. Okay? Daniel uh, predicted the Messiah. He predicted that the Messiah would come and he would take care of things in the end of time, right before the end of time. And um, in, in Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, uh, he stated, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is the one that will never be destroyed. So the Jews were aware of this prophecy, the, the Jewish religious leaders. They, they were aware of it. So they knew that the Messiah to come would be the Son of God. They knew that he... Um, um, and the Father were one. That was a common understanding. But they didn't think that Jesus fit the bill. Why? They were expecting someone to come in the image of King David, who was a grand, mighty warrior who basically took it to the enemies that were, uh, that were against them. And Jesus wasn't fitting this description. So they, they had a real problem with him saying that God was his father. When the, Jesus told the religious leaders that God was his father, he doesn't directly quote uh, Daniel in this passage, but he fits the description Daniel is giving of the future Messiah, even though the religious leaders couldn't see it. They had interpreted the Old Testament, through their own set of lenses. They, they had something stuck in their mind as to what they wanted the Word of God to tell them. And they discussed it amongst themselves, and they actually formed a theology that was false because they were looking at things through a human lens. They weren't looking at things the way God intended them to look at. And, um, you see, um, people become confused when, uh, when you talk about the Trinity. Now, there was no confusion here. The prophets clearly outlined that the Messiah would be the Son of God. So they understood that there was a Trinity. Um, as a matter of fact, back right at the beginning of the Old Testament, um, in Genesis chapter 1, 26, when God created uh, humanity, when he decided to create humanity, we hear this in Genesis 1.26. Um, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the uh, wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So in, in saying that let us make man in our image, God said that, God singular said let us make man in our image. This is the first picture of the Trinity that we have in the, uh, in the Old Testament. And, and there's, just, there's different places in the Old Testament where we see um, the doctrine of the Trinity building, and it follows through into the New Testament as well. And this is where people get confused. Um, you know, God uh, describes himself as being a plurality of persons. And, and when you read Daniel there, it, it talks about um, a son of man 
coming into the, to the uh, presence of the Ancient of Days, and then coming down to earth as, as king and being worshipped. Okay? So, um, in the New Testament, we've, as we've recently discussed, we saw uh, John the Baptist, right? When he saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized, uh, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when he went into the waters of baptism, we remember that God spoke um, audibly through the Father. The Father spoke audibly. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And we see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, descending on him in bodily form like a dove. So we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit all together. And this was the start of Jesus' earthly ministry when he launched his earthly ministry. This was the start of it. With the Father endorsing the fact that he indeed was the Son, he's the Messiah, and that the Holy Spirit would, was with him as well and, and, and remained on him. So the three are together. God all together, one, in three different persons. Now this is confusing to the human mind. I know that you know, we, don't, we don't operate that way. When, when I see uh, a son of man, I'm thinking that's the son of man. When I see the ancient of days, uh, well, would we have two gods here? No, no. there is only one God, but he, 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 he is made up of three different equal persons. Okay? The Father has the authority overall, and the authority of the Father is given to the Son, who is the Son of Man, and the Spirit and the Son of Man came to earth and worked in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, Jesus does his miraculous work in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And he, ju- he does this on purpose. This, this scripture in Luke chapter 4.18 tells us this. Jesus said in this scripture, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. So God anointed Jesus as the Son to be the Savior. And in, all, and in, in the Acts of the Apostles, in Acts chapter 10, 37 and 38, the Apostle Peter, when he was explaining the gospel to the crowd, he said, you know what has happened through the province of Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So, is the man who appeared in Daniel's vision to be a separate uh, God from the ancient of days? He was worshipped, right? No. No. He, he and the Father are one. One God. The Son came into the world as the second person of the Godhead. We talk a triune God. We've heard this before, but I'm just... Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard this explanation. See, um, is Jesus the Son of Man? Uh, because he's just a human being alone? And is he a created being? No. Jesus was worshipped. The Bible says, and this is very clear, and the book of John really outlines the person of Jesus Christ. It starts in the book of John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, is the living God who created the whole universe. See? Now, a lot of people get confused about this. But John um, wants people to understand, uh, I, I think, and, and, and affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. You see, Jesus only does what the Father gives him authority to do, if that makes sense. Because they're in perfect harmony, in total agreement. There is no difference. It's not like... You know, like with me and my son, we have differences of opinion about all kinds of things. 
my sons don't necessarily see eye to eye with me on different ways of doing things. They think, oh, dad's stuck in the mud. He's an old-fashioned guy, you know, stuck in the mud. I like this new way. Well, what about this technology, dad? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's just do it the old way, right? That's what dads do sometimes. <laughs> you know, it works sometimes. <laughs> I like to think it works better, but it doesn't always. <laughs> sometimes they surprise me, and I go, oh, boy, I better get on that, <laughs> Right? But there's no such division in the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all in complete harmony and unity. There is no disagreement. There is no division uh, of any sort. There is no different perspective. They are one God. Three persons. One God. Now, the Jewish religious leaders, they understood this principle. That's why they were wanted to kill Jesus because he was claiming equality with God. So they understood that when Jesus told them he was sent by the Father, he was claiming that, uh, that he and the Father were, were one. And uh, to them, that was totally blasphemous. Nevertheless, Jesus tells them the truth. Jesus tells them, despite what they're doing and what they're saying and, and how they're treating him, Jesus tells them the truth. In verse 20, Jesus says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Not part, all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So Jesus affirms with those critiquing him that he is unified with the Father, and he proves the blessing of the Father on him and his unity with the Father through the miraculous signs and wonders that he is performing. Now, even Nicodemus the Pharisee came to Jesus at night. We remember we just talked about this a couple weeks ago. With the conclusion that Jesus had to be from God. He said in John 3, 2, if you remember, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, these, guys, these teachers of the law were trying to figure this out. How could... How could Jesus, who obviously to them is not fitting the, the, the description of the Messiah, how could he do all these miraculous works? Hmm, maybe it's because he's got a demon. That's what it is. He, he's diverting people away from the fact that he isn't the Son of God but because he's got a demon. That's, that's it. Yeah, for sure. Well, Jesus rebukes that. You know, a kingdom divided against itself will never stand, says the Lord Jesus, right? So, Jesus goes on with his description of the authority of the position that he has by telling them he has equality with the Father God and raising the dead even and giving life to whoever he chooses. In verse 21, he states that as the Son, he will raise the dead just as the Father God raises the dead. So he says, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. Well, it's hard to think of power and authority that, that is greater, I don't think there is, than someone who can raise someone from the dead. The religious leaders didn't want to think much about Jesus' ability to heal a paralytic. They focused on Him as a Sabbath breaker. They were so concerned with their own interpretation of the law up here that they missed the whole point. Jesus was showing mercy to this poor crippled guy on the Sabbath day, and he heals them. And they totally looked this over. They looked over that. Yet the power of Jesus, what Jesus is saying here, is my power goes far beyond just raising a paralytic back to health. As a matter of fact, I have power over life and death. At this point, they didn't realize it, but Jesus would show his authority uh, over life and death by, by raising two people from the dead. Jairus' daughter, if you, you recall in the Gospels, was raised from the dead. She was dead, and she was raised back to life. And then we have Lazarus, who was dead in the grave for four days, who was raised back to life. 
And the interesting thing is, is these, these teachers of the law were so stuck on their interpretation of Scripture based on what they had up here and what they projected onto the Scripture um, that they, they missed the fact that Jesus w- was God. Like, he was the Messiah. He raised people from the dead. They rose, he rose Lazarus from the dead, and they even conspired to try and kill Lazarus to prove their point. Folks, we've got to be very careful in our humanness, in our head knowledge that we don't project interpretation into the Word of God based on our own theology that we have discussed with other people. We've got to take the Word of God as it is. We have to look at the Word of God as it is and draw our theology from the teaching of the Word of God. We don't take an idea that we come up with, that we've discussed with our friends or other people that are religious out there, and then go into the Word of God to to find support for our theology. No, we take the Word of God and we take it for face value and we look at it as a whole in context and that's where we have to draw our theology from. And if if we're stuck in our head trying to figure out Christianity and trying to figure out theology and doctrine in our head, we're going to get it wrong because we're going to miss it. It's only the Holy Spirit that takes the Word and brings it to life as we're, as we're looking at it. The Word of God is truth and power, but without the Spirit's bringing it to life inside of us, be, between the connection here and the connection here, we're going to get it wrong. Now, there's all kinds of heresy out there in the, in, the, in the world of Christendom that comes from people using what I call eisegetical methodology when they look at, and this is one of the Sunday school words, kids, if you don't understand. Is there any kids here? Eisegetical me- method of reading the Bible. It's like, I read the Bible and I, and I pick and choose the verses that apply to me. So I formulate my own ideas first, and then I go fishing for, for things that support my ideas. That's eisegesis. It is one of the most harmful things that has entered the church, and it, it's not just in the modern-day church, but in the, in the old church as well. In the, in the beginning, people were doing that, and they are coming to the wrong conclusions because they are approaching it through human wisdom. Rather than going to the word of Christ and the word of the apostles and taking their theology as it came through there, illuminated by the Spirit, of course, they began to look at the Bible and pick and choose and formulate their... That's why there's all kinds of weird doctrines out there that are off base or way off. This is how people come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is not God. He has to be a created being because... They don't see the totality of the scripture talking about the Trinity. They don't, it, it just goes over them. And I, I've talked to some people about this and they're just like, nope, it doesn't make sense. Well, guess what? Some of the things that God does might not, to- we might not totally understand. But we have to take the word of God at face value because the word is truth. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit brings to life. And then, ah, I get it. I understand. You ever notice that? Like maybe you were, before you were a Christian, you looked at the Word of God and you couldn't get it, you couldn't understand it. And you thought it meant a certain thing, but then all of a sudden, when you submit the, the Lordship of your heart to Jesus Christ, you, you bow the knee of your heart to Him and you say, Lord Jesus, be my Master, be my Lord, be my Savior. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit enters into you and then the light comes on. Amen, right? And now, as Christians, when we're reading the Scriptures, um, God designed it so that the light would come on. So we're not just reading monotonous... You know, some of the things, like the genealogies and stuff, you know, we can read that and, oh man, that's hard when you're, when you're tired. You know? But the, if you actually allow the Spirit to speak, even into those passages, you see the reason behind it. There's a reason behind it, and the Spirit gives you this enlightenment that brings it to life. That's why you can read the same passage over ten times and come up with ten different things that are so deep and profound. Like every time you read it, it's like a new, a new gemstone found on, this, on, the, on the walls of this, 
of this, pl- of this cave that you've gone into. There's all these gemstones, and every time you visit it and, shine, and the light shines on the, on the wall, you go, wow, that's so cool. Yeah, that's the way God is. He made it so simple to come in, 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 into salvation because even uh, the simplest of us and the youngest children need to understand so that they can come into the kingdom of God. So it's a very simple message. The gospel in its essence is very simple. But the knowledge and the depth of the word of God and the revelation that's there, it's so fathomlessly deep, you can't ever come to the bottom of it. The longer you steep yourself in it, the more you realize that you need to learn. Oh God, help us to be exegetical in our approach, to be open to what the Spirit would teach us. I can't come to the place where I'm proud and say, I know it all. Guess what? If I think I know it all, I'm going to come with a very very rude awakening. In fact, God's going to show me that I don't know it all and that I need to learn more. I need to understand more. Okay, so, Jesus says, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so even the Son gives life to whom he pleases to give it. So Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah, calling Israel's future Savior the Son of Man. The Son of Man will be God in the flesh. Isaiah is very clear about this. The prophet predicted that he would rule the governments of the world. The Son would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Isaiah 9.1, we read this at Christmas all the time because it's a Christmas scripture. But it's not just for Christmas. It's not just one time a year where we remember what Jesus did in coming to the world as the Son of Man. No. For, uh, for to us a child is born, says Isaiah 9.1. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There you have it. There's another mention of the Trinity. The Son shall be called Everlasting Father. The the three are one. In John 5, and 23, Jesus continues to tell them the truth about who he is. He says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that, they, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. God the Father gave his work of judgment to God the Son so that the people would honor Jesus as they should and they should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Jesus even gets more specific in claiming that he is the key to escaping God's judgment over sin and receiving eternal life. In verse 24 uh, to 26, he says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming, and has now come, that when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Did you hear that? This is an amazing thing. God sent Jesus into the world to be God in the flesh, to be God with human skin on, the Son of Man. So we could look at Jesus, we could look at his life, his ministry, his attitudes, his actions, and everything, and know that this is an accurate reflection of God because he is. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, he was in the beginning before all things. He created all things by his powerful word. He sustains all things. Jesus stated what we just read in verse 25 and 26, that as the Son of God, he came into the world to bring dead people back to life. And he was not not just speaking about Lazarus and Jairus' daughter, who he would physically bring back to life as a sign to show what his authority was over life and death. Earlier in John chapter 3, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about entering the kingdom of God, he told Nicodemus that those who enter the kingdom of God must be born again. In other words, Jesus told Nicodemus something like this. Don't you understand? 
that people are walking around spiritually dead in their sins and they need to be rebirthed back to life before they can experience the kingdom of God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death came into the world. Jesus is saying that the first Adam brought spiritual death. And he was saying also that he, as the son, would be the second Adam who would bring spiritual life to the people so that whoever came to him and believed on him, they could inherit eternal life in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus was the key to spiritual rebirth, from death to life. Jesus is the key. Jesus is the sacrificial offering for the sin that needed to be taken out of the way so that we are a clean vessel for the Holy Spirit to come and live in. And he exemplified this work by coming here and showing us everything that he did. Hmm. The Apostle Paul explains this so well in 1 Corinthians 15, um, 42 to 49. I have to read this passage. I was looking at this passage. I've like, got to read this passage because it's so powerful. It so takes what we're learning in John and puts it on the, on, on, on the ground level so that we can understand it. He says this, um, So it will be with the resurrection of the, the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there, was an, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. So I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will, all, we will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow, powerful, powerful. You see the application point. Jesus came as the life-giving spirit to bring us back to life. And he's telling the Pharisees this, and they're not getting it. Many people claim to worship God, but deny that Jesus Christ is God. They say that he was a good man or more godlike than any other man, but, they, but God requires that men give him the same honor that they give to God the Father. Jesus tells those listening that as the Son of God, the Father has given him the authority to judge the people of the world. In verse 27, he says, and, and he has given him authority to, to, authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. So, he, In other words, Jesus told those listening that he was the God-man that the Father had sent into the world. He is the Messiah. Yet, fully God and the Son of Man, yet without sin. Born of a virgin. See, all of it ties in together. He had to have God as his father and had to have a human mother, but couldn't have the sin nature. Perfect God. Perfect man. Perfect. The Alpha. The Omega. The beginning and the end. The great I am, who always was, is now, and always will be. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. So he has 
And the Father has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. In other words, um, Jesus says in 28 to 30, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming where all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus says that it's not just him who is bringing a testimony about he, who he is. Right? He stands behind the authority of the Father. And the law of Moses and all of the prophets point to him being that one. Consider what David wrote prophetically concerning the Messiah. In Psalm 110.1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And for this reason, Jesus said in verses 31 and 32 of our text, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor and I know that his testimony about me is true. Jesus tells them that it is the Father God who testifies that He is the one and only Son. And He continues saying to them in verses 33 to 35, you have, you have sent to John and He has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you might be saved. See, John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy His light. So He's reminding these people that were trying to figure out who John the Baptist was, he was reminding them that when Jesus was seen by John coming towards him, John pointed him out and says, this is the one that I was telling you about that I'm here to prepare the way for. I'm not even unworthy, I'm not even worthy to untie the, sandals of his, the straps of his sandals. I'm not worthy because he was before me. He was before me. He is the one, I baptize you with water for repentance. But this guy, this one, he's the Messiah. He's the one that is going to baptize people in, not just water. He's going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he is the great I am. That's why. All authority has been given to him. See, they, they were so busy being religious outside of the Father's intention. They were approaching everything from their own perspective, for their own pride. They didn't have the love of God in their hearts. Jesus, he, he's giving them this testimony to try and get through to them. And also as a testimony to us. And the Father who sent me, he says, in verse 37, has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You see, religion always, always, always focuses on gnat-sized issues. When there are camels that are being swallowed, they're trying to strain out the gnat and swallowing this gigantic camel and getting it all wrong. Jesus rebukes them in 39, verse 39 to 42. You study the scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. How he must have agonized over seeing these people that it's studied, 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 studied. So much of the Old Testament. How, some of them knew the Old Testament off by heart. They studied it so much. Like there were Pharisees there. There were Sadducees there. There were teachers of the law there. They knew. They knew the Bible, but they did not know God because it was all here and it hadn't connected to here. They didn't see the heart of God. 
Oh, and they were so stubborn. They were so stubborn. It's a terrible thing to think that men, with the Scriptures in their hands, focusing so much energy on trying to figure out the Scriptures, could be so blinded. Paul the Apostle says it about himself, right? And that's why the whole thing with Damascus and the road on to Damascus where God blinded him to show him how blind he in fact was spiritually. And he needed prayer. He needed some poor guy named Ananias to come along and, and, and God chose to, to use Ananias to lay hands on him and pray for him. And then the scales fell off. Now he sees. I was blind, but now I see amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Jesus came to take the blinders off to show us the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said this. He says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another? But do not seek the glory that comes from the one and only God, from the, from the only God. See, that's actually a prophetic word. These guys rejected Christ. They had him crucified. But he also makes another prediction that one day there's going to be someone who's going to come in the guise of being the Savior, in the guise of being the Christ. But in fact, he's not going to be the Christ. He's going to be the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul wrote about this to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 to 10. See, the Antichrist is going to be coming onto the stage. There have been many Antichrists in the past, but the one main Antichrist is going to be coming. And, and uh, Paul says, And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all kinds of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. So there is even going to be delusions coming because there's power in the, in the enemy as well as in, in, in God. Now the enemy doesn't have power over life and death. Only God has that but the enemy definitely has some power and he's going to give the illusion out there that he's the Messiah, but God, Jesus, is going to come back and overcome him. And uh, we know the, the story in Revelation if we've read it. The fact was that the religious leaders, they were deceived by Satan. Their mind was twisted by a whisper that was not of God. See, they, they weren't interested in God. They were interested in themselves. That's what they're interested in. You ever, if you notice that someone who's claiming to be a teacher, a follower of Christ, is more interested in themselves than they are about the kingdom of God and about doing the work of God of rescuing orphans and widows in their distress and being keeping themselves from being polluted by the world. If they're more interested in hoarding things in glory and things for themselves than they are with that, you know that they have deception written all over them. You want to know a deceiver? Look at the way they carry themselves and you will see. By the fruit, you will know them. Selfishness is the devil's religion. It always has been and it always will be. God came and showed himself to be a servant of all. You want to know the difference? Keep your eyes open. Okay, but these Pharisees, they didn't. They were more concerned about what other people thought about them and about their positions of power and about the religious systems that they had put in place that they didn't want anyone to rock the boat on because it was all driven from here and it was driven from pride and it was driven from self-interest rather than the interest of God. So, that's a person, as long as a person, I believe this to be true, is more concerned about what people think about them than what God thinks, they cannot be saved. 
if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have got to let go of what other people think about you and not care. You have to think uh, solely about your life in terms of how God looks at you and how, what God says. And Jesus continues in 45, But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? See, Moses wrote to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. I'm going to read both 15 and 18. This is a prophetic word about the Messiah. And Jesus confronts them about this. He's like, Moses said this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like, like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. He's talking about the Son of Man. He's talking about the Messiah. In verse 18, Moses continues because he needs to emphasize this with the people. Moses was speaking to the people about the Messiah. He says, um, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. This is the Father. Jesus says, I can't do anything outside of what the Father tells me to do because there's perfect harmony. There's perfect unity in the Trinity. There's many other Old Testament passages that point to Jesus as the Messiah. If the religious leaders of the Jews really believed Moses, they would have believed Jesus as well because Moses spoke about Jesus coming. He spoke about the Son of Man and what he would be like. And the prophets spoke as well. See, they were breaking Moses' instituted covenant. They, they were applying the scriptures to their, what they thought should be applied in their head but they totally missed the boat when it came to the heart of God being that of love. God doesn't do anything unless it's filtered through love. They missed that. In Isaiah 53, it's just like, the, it's just like Isaiah prophesied. It's just like he prophesied, which stated, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like, from, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. This prophecy about the Son of Man was being fulfilled in this passage in John. Jesus was rejected by the religious institution, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the teachers of the law who thought they knew better, but they were so far from God because their heart was not connected to the love of God as the love letter in the scriptures points out. See, Jesus points to the fact that he was both the Son of Man and Son of God. His claim was that he and the Father were of the same mind. They weren't looking for a Jesus kind of Messiah. They wanted a kick-butt, polished um, guy who would, who would be gleaming and, and that they could look at it and go, wow, he's the perfect, perfect human being in all regards. He's ruddy, he's handsome, he's, he's got... The world by the tail, he's, he, he speaks when he speaks. He's got this magical quality about how he speaks. Um, he's polished. Look at his teeth. They're all, they're, all, they're all straight. There's no crooked teeth in his mouth. Nice and polished white. Eh, gleaming white. Eh. Hey, that draws the attention of man, doesn't it? It draws the attention of man. It's a Hollywood Jesus. It's not the real Jesus. Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem in the smallest, most obscure village. He was born in a stable amongst the livestock. There was no beauty or majesty that we should be attracted to him. He wasn't, he wasn't the one they were looking at. No, no, they were expecting some guy like, you know, I don't know, 
I don't think there's anyone in history that matches the description of what they had in their mind would be uh, Jesus. I mean, they've, they've come close and they've, they've proclaimed false messiahs all the way through from the time of Jesus forward. But there's going to be a deception out there, guys. You watch. One of these days, someone's going to walk out onto the world stage and he's going to have that gleaming sparkle when he smiles. People are going to go, wow. Oh, look at that guy. He's so charismatic. He's so dynamic. He's got it all together. Look at him. He must be the Messiah. Why? Because they're, they're looking at it through the pride of man. Not the suffering servant. So, the Old Testament was the record of God's revelation, but they worshipped the words of the Old Testament scriptures instead of the creator of the words. We can worship the words in the Bible and miss the heart of the creator if we just approach it through here. We've got to be asking the Lord to have mercy on us and help us to see as he sees. When you read your word, when you read the Bible, okay, it is truth and there is power in the word. It is truth and there is power in the word. That's not what I'm saying. It's not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you read the word of God, you need the illumination of God to show you how you ought to apply it and how it fits into the big picture. You must be careful to read and study the Word as God reveals it to us by the Spirit. Jesus. The Old Testament points towards Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament, all of the stories that the kids are learning in Sunday school right now that you studied when you were a kid, they all point to Jesus. They're pointing to the cross. They're either saying something about our need for the cross or they're showing us something about God in his character that points to what he did on the cross. Everything in the Old Testament filters down to our need for a Savior and the cross of Jesus Christ. And everything in the New Testament points back to the cross. Everything points back to Jesus. He is the centerpiece. He's the centerpiece. He's the supreme revelation by, whom, by whose light all other revelation in the Bible is to be tested. You want to know context? Look at it that way. Look at it through the, through the, through the, the spectrum of, of the cross and everything Jesus did there, everything he was there. Look at it through that. Filter it through that. That's how you're going to stay on track because the Spirit testifies to Christ. He testifies of Christ. And he will show you the way. So we don't have to be like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the teachers of the law who are blinded by their own pride, by their own mind. We can be people that humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and say, Jesus, I don't want to have my own way. I don't want to do things my own way. I want to do things your way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waited, yielded, and still. That's the cry of the true believer's heart. Have thine own way, Lord. Is that your cry today? When you approach your Christian walk, is it all about what you want to fashion for your life? Or is it about him and what he wants? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you for the precious Holy Spirit that has come. Lord, you have come to dwell in us. We are thankful, Jesus, that you've saved us from our sins, that we believe in you, Lord, and that the Father sent you. And Lord, we know that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to show us the way, to open our understanding so that we know where to place our feet. We can't do this without you, Lord. And we know that you provided the way for us so that we don't have to, Lord. We don't have to navigate this alone. You are our teacher. You are our comforter. You are our strength when we feel weak. When we don't understand, Lord, we rest on you. And we ask that you would have your own way, Lord, in our lives. Have your own way 
in our families. As fathers, Lord, help us to let you have your own way in us and through us. Help us not to be stubborn and dig in, but help us to look at things exegetically. In Jesus' name, amen. God's grace and peace rest on you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.